All right, everyone, welcome back. It's 2.30 and we are going to get started with our lake ecology session for this afternoon. This is our last session of the afternoon. Uh, once again, we're gonna be doing our Q&A at the end of the session. So please send your questions to info at walpa.org and Darren will field them for us um, as we reach the end of our session today, which is scheduled for 3.50. Uh, to start today's session on lake ecology, we have Becca Styling. She's going to be talking to us about some rainbow trout populations in the high, eleva high elevation lakes. So thanks, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Styling, and I'm excited to share with you some results from my master's research exploring sources of carbon to lake ecosystems. My talk is titled Determinants of Resource Use by Rainbow Trout in High Elevation Lake. Our complex systems are in our minds and on our maps. We also know and have evidence that ecosystems around the world have our complex systems where energy and nutrients are constantly moving across these delineated boundaries. These movements of nutrients and energy and the links that form between habitats can support secondary production. Early stems from three distinct habitats. In the open water habitat, we have pelagic primary production. The submerged illuminated edge habitat is the littoral zone. And here we have littoral benthic primary production, attached algae essentially growing in a thin layer on the bottom, which is grazed by primary consumers. Littoral benthic algae can be a significant contributor to the overall amount of carbon supporting upper trophic levels in lakes. And last, terrestrial primary production can be a contributor to the energetic base of lakes too. And in this case, carbon fixed by terrestrial plants is exported from the surrounding watershed to the lake as dissolved or particulate organic matter or in the form of organisms that wind up as prey to an aquatic predator. Research demonstrates that aquatic consumers' reliance on basal resources from these three habitats fluctuates widely. Rachel, we're going to reload the video and start again. If you could just uh, give us one. All right, everyone. Uh, we are, you know, going through it together. <laughs> We're going to try reloading Becca's presentation. So what we're going to do is move forward to our next presentation. Uh, just so you all know, all of these presentations for this particular session are pre-recorded, but our speakers are all present for our Q&A at the end. So we're going to start up Angela Strucker's presentation now, and we're going to try and work on Becca's presentation to get reloaded for you all to listen to later. Hi everyone, my name is Angela Strucker and I'm here to talk to you about primary succession and community assembly in ponds created by the historic eruption of Mount St. Helens. And before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this work, uh, Meredith Holgerson, Tara Lee Pritzfeli, and Jim Gowell. So the eruption of Mount St. Helens was a massive landscape change. Um, so this uh, occurred in 1980, and most people in Washington and surrounding states will be really familiar with, with this event, um, maybe having visited there themselves. It's an amazing place to visit if you've never been. And um, many, you know, there were many different forces, destructive forces that occurred uh, relating to the blast, including um, the blown down forest and the light green and the scorched forest and the dark green and the pyroclastic flows, um, as well as landslides, mud flows, and debris avalanches. 
And this last one, the debris avalanche in uh, yellow, is what we're most interested for the purposes of this talk, because it's in this um, region that um, more than 100 ponds were created following the eruption. So this is a USGS picture showing, um, looking roughly uh, northwards um, from the, the kind of western side of the Mount St. Helens, um, in that yellow zone that I was kind of pointing out on the map in the previous slide. Um, so the debris came and went kind of this direction um, to the west, and um, this was Coldwater Creek, um, is now Coldwater Lake, so the debris blocked that. Um, and you can see from the kind of topographic complexity in this uh, lower part of the photo that these um, depressions in the land are getting filled with, with water, either by um, groundwater or surface water. Um, and this is showing, uh, this is from four years after the eruption. So you see this, this was a, a process that didn't, you know, happen kind of um, instantaneously, but, you know, developed uh, over time. Today, these ponds look a lot different. Um, and so um, this is an example of uh, kind of a steeply sided, uh, more kind of um, hummocks pond. And um, we see that there's a lot of, you know, there's a great difference in the um, terrestrial environment. Um, there, there was very little organic material in the debris avalanche. And so um, since that time, there's been great um, change. Um, and these ponds vary quite dramatically in terms of their, um, their depth and their size and their shape, as well as the degree to which they have uh, canopy cover. So this is an example of a really open pond. And then we can contrast that with some ponds that look like this that have almost an entirely um, covered canopy and a great deal of both terrestrial and aquatic vegetation. So the kind of overarching question that we're um, asking here is, you know, how does primary succession succeed in aquatic environments? And, you know, this is a question that's been studied in, in terrestrial systems, you know, for um, you know, decades, if not centuries. But there's very few good examples in, in aquatic environments. And so the question that we're kind of um, trying to answer is, you know, does it proceed in the same way that terrestrial succession does? And can we study um, community assembly and un try to understand the factors that um, influence it through time? And this um, Mount St. Helens system is perfect for this question because it's essentially um, a natural experiment with a lot of replication because all the ponds were created at roughly the same time. Um, and there's a large number, so over 100 of them, that, as we said, vary you know, quite dramatically in terms of um, a number of different features. So it gives us kind of a nice palette to work with. In the broader context, we can try to understand which species end up where by thinking about the regional species pool, so what species are in the region. Um, and the first kind of uh, filter is this dispersal and chance um, events that occur. We call this a stochastic filter. And this kind of sorts um, and works to influence, um, you know, which species kind of move around. The next set of filters are more deterministic. So the, these are things like the environment and biotic interactions that happen in communities. And ultimately, we have these local communities that look um, are a subset of the regional species pool and may look more or less similar to each other, depending on how species kind of interact with these different um, these different filters. So our question was whether or not the assembly of invertebrate communities in these Mount St. Helen ponds was influenced more by deterministic or stochastic factors and whether or not we can still kind of see legacy effects of, um, you know, this and um, the fact that these are still pretty new communities. Okay, so um, I showed a map um, before um, that was shortly after the eruption, and this is a more recent one, and we see that there are quite dramatic changes have occurred in the landscape. Here's the, um, the cone of Mount St. Helens, here's Coldwater Lake, and so we're interested in this region that was part of the debris avalanche zone, so south of Coldwater Lake. And if we look, um, here's the outflow. Um, you can kind of see where it goes under um, the highway and then it goes down to the North Fork of the Toodle River. And so we have kind of two main um, complexes, we call them, of ponds um, that are have some differences that may influence how succession proceeds. And so we have the upper set, um, the Marauder Ponds, 
um, and then the lower step, the Hummox Ponds. And if anyone's ever been to this um, part of the state before, there's a, actually a really nice hiking trail that you can go around to, um, a lot, and you can see a large number of these ponds. It's really, it's quite, um, it's quite amazing. And you tend to see a lot of school kids there, so it's very fun. Um, so um, these ponds also, in terms of, um, they differ in terms of, you know, their um, uh, environmental conditions, so differences in terrestrial vegetation, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the following slide. But they also um, differ in terms of their spatial arrangement. And so the ponds in the Murado tend to be denser and closer together on average than the ponds in the hummocks. And you can kind of see that the ponds here are quite a bit more spaced out and, and, and farther from each other than the ponds in the Murado complex. This is a, um, an aerial from uh, 19, um, 1995 in Google Earth, and it kind of shows that even, you know, 15 years past the blast, still the terrestrial um, succession was still ongoing, and there were still uh, lots of places that were relatively barren, um, but still you see some, you're starting to see some pockets of um, what will be green in the following photo. Uh, in 2004, we see that the Murata has really filled in, in terms of terrestrial vegetation, um, almost complete coverage. And we see that in the hummocks region, um, there's more, but still quite a bit of um, more bare ground. And that that has kind of proceeded up until 2014, the most recent photo, where um, we see, again, lots of terrestrial vegetation up in the Murata and then filling in. And we also see that the, some of the ponds are starting to get kind of encroached upon um, by the terrestrial um, wetland vegetation. Okay, so um, I kind of mentioned some of these broad in, um, gradients in terms of sizes and shape, but there's also differences in terms of um, canopy cover. And so this map is showing, you know, anywhere from essentially, you know, one to 99% canopy cover um, within the Murata complex up here and then the Hummox complex down here. Big differences in terms of pond area um, here on, a, a, on this meter squared. But also in terms of chemistry, big differences in terms of um, conductivity, uh, hydro period ranging anywhere from, um, you know, essentially only holding water for a couple months in spring to ones that are perennially wet, uh, as well as um, differences in the terrestrial matrix and aquatic productivity. So in 2015 and 2017, we went out in the spring and sampled ponds um, for physical and chemical parameters. So kind of your basic suite of um, variables that you'd want to know. Uh, we also sampled for chlorophyll, zooplankton, and macroinvertebrates, um, and some landscape variables as well. And this is kind of, you know, it's interesting because these ponds, some of them are sh so short-lived that you really have a short window of time to get out there and sample. And so sometimes it was, um, we just weren't able to get to some ponds in time. Okay, so the first results I want to show are looking at environmental structure across the two regions of ponds. And this is a principal components analysis that um, shows, you know, similarities in, um, in the uh, ordination space uh, and, and um, how that relates to the actual ponds themselves. And so ones that are closer together would be more similar. And so we see that there's, um, you know, a lot of correlation between um, the aquatic productivity um, in terms of chlorophyll, nutrients, carbon, um, and that's also highly correlated with pond canopy cover. So that makes a lot of sense that the high nutrient ponds are more productive and probably that's linked to terrestrial um, productivity as well. And then on the other side, we see ponds that tend to be um, larger, deeper, and have a longer hydro period. And those tend to be less, um, less productive, but also have warmer temperatures in them. And so when we overlay the sites on here, I'm not going to show the individual sites, but just kind of drawing a circle around where they are. Most of them are kind of on the right side of this, um, the warmer, larger, deeper, longer hydro period. Um, and then the Murata ponds are more on the left-hand side of this that tend to be more productive, more canopy cover, um, but smaller um, and, and less sh and shallower. Looking in terms of species richness or taxon richness, uh, first showing zooplankton, uh, we don't really see any differences um, between regions or differences over time. So 2015 and 2017 results were pretty similar. And pretty um, depauperate, um, so that's not really a really large number of, of taxon to find in a, um, in a pond. 
And looking now at macroinvertebrates on the bottom here, we see, again, um, no significant differences between the two regions, um, nor are there really big differences over time. And so, um, again, also very um, a very small number of taxa present um, in these ponds on average. The last analysis I want to present um, is uh, looking at beta diversity, which is essentially what is the similarity between the composition of all, you know, any pairwise combination of ponds. And to do this properly, we have to control for differences in alpha diversity, because as alpha diversity increases towards its uh, maximum of the regional pool size, um, beta diversity has to get uh, smaller and smaller because, you know, they're, all the species are present. Um, and the reverse of this is that when alpha diversity is low, beta diversity is, is, has to be high because there's um, so much more turnover between ponds. Okay, so what this means is that we can use this construct to kind of understand stochastic and deterministic factors. And so um, we can think about this in terms of, you know, where um, all pairwise combinations of ponds fall in this space. And so if you fall kind of below the line, your composition is more similar than you would expect by chance. If you fall above the line, you're less similar than expected by chance. And then I think kind of along the line is the, the you know, essentially the null expectation. So then we can ascribe some um, mechanistic explanations to these. So um, for the less similar, we can predict that um, strong biotic interactions are occurring. Dispersal is probably very low um, because you're getting, you know, um, communities that are not very similar to each other with uh, variation in environmental conditions driving differences in communities. In this lower, um, more similar component, we think that environmental filtering is strong. And so the environment is selecting for just a subset of species that can tolerate conditions. And therefore, they're really, the communities are very similar to each other. And then if we get something kind of along this line, we predict that dispersal is high and random events are having a big effect on community composition. Okay, so what this translates into is um, beta scaled between positive one and negative one. And so a value of one would be completely dissimilar, a value of negative one completely similar, and then around zero would be kind of a, our stochastic effect. Okay, so looking at the results for um, beta diversity, first for zooplankton, with uh, in the bottom here a reminder about what a positive or negative value uh, means. And I'm kind of giving away the plot a little bit here um, because you see these are all negatively scaled values. Um, but what we see in 2015 is that um, the hummox ponds tend to be pretty negative, um, meaning that the communities were much more similar than we would expect by chance. The Murata was um, a little bit um, kind of intermediate, that maybe a little bit closer to zero. But interestingly, when we resampled in 2017, we saw the opposite trend. We saw that the hummocks ponds were a lot more stochastic, um, um, closer to zero compared to the Murata. So that's a good lesson to just stick to one year sampling if you can. <laughs> um, when we look at macroinvertebrates, I'm just kidding. And um, when we look at macroinvertebrates, um, we see that the um, trends were kind of more similar in the sense that the hummix was always kind of more negative than the Murata. Um, but again, differences between years. And we see that, um, you know, values a lot closer to zero for um, macroinvertebrates in the Murata, which probably reflects the fact that the ponds are really close together and, and macroinvertebrates are a lot more mobile and can get around and disperse more um, in, across the pond landscape. Okay, so to quickly sum up, um, assembly seems to have been shaped by different mechanisms in different regions in different years. And so that's not necessarily very satisfying, but it does tell us that there's, you know, this is a really dynamic process and it's, it, it's going to be influenced by a number of different factors over time. Um, despite the fact that we had pretty strong environmental gradients, uh, we found that communities were really similar. And so what to me this says is that um, there's, you know, we're getting generalist species that can survive almost anywhere. And so um, the environment isn't really having kind of a more nuanced effect. It's just like a big filter that, you know, only lets in super to tolerant organisms. We also, the interannual variation in patterns is interesting. And we think, you know, potentially that has to do, we could use traits to try to understand that a little bit better. And um, for example, um, 
we look at zooplankton and we can kind of categorize taxa into good and poor dispersers, we see that, you know, this is, um, it differs from year to year and it differs from, um, you know, region to region. And so traits may be a helpful way to kind of understand, you know, do we see um, the years with more stochastic, do we see more good dispersing species in ponds? And hydrology may also be an important factor. So um, this is kind of ongoing work with collaborators at the University of Regina. And um, here we're looking at isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen. And I'm not going to get deep into this, but suffice to say that it's really different between years. And so um, in 2015, we see this big spread. There's lots of potential water sources that are playing a role in their hydrology in that year and a lot of evaporation signaling that potentially it was a really warm year. Um, whereas in 2017, um, the snowpack was much more influential in, in, in pond hydrology, likely suggesting a single water source was important. And so that, again, is, gonna, is bound to have effects on um, you know, the organisms that live there. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up by um, just kind of reiterating this is a really useful study system to understand you know, our theories about community assembly and primary succession. Um, and, you know, we only saw kind of signals of some processes occurring, but that might change in the future. Um, it's, a, it's really dynamic. More generally, this is, a, you know, kind of an important way for us to understand how humans affect the landscape and how communities respond to those disturbances. So I'm going to wrap up by thanking um, a number of different field and lab assistants that have worked uh, with us over time, and I'll happily take any questions. Hey, thanks so much, Angela. And Angela will be here to answer your questions live at the end of our session. So again, please email them to info at walpa.org. Uh, up next, in a twist of events, Becca is going to use her PowerPoint to give us her presentation live. Um, thank you so much, Becca. I'm super excited that we're getting this to work out. And take it away. Great. So I can start on slide four um, to the crew. This will be a wild ride. My heart is beating really fast right now. <laughs> All right. Should I start? Thumbs up? OK. All right, so the backdrop of this project is that the carbon supporting upper, upper trophic levels in lakes is originating in three distinct habitats. We have uh, the standard pelagic primary production occurring, pulling carbon out of our CO2 out of the water and making it available to the rest of the food web, littoral, which is attached algae, and terrestrial. And upper trophic levels. Um, can rely on varying amounts of carbon from different places. So here, starting with a pretty simple plot, um, looking at attached algae. And it's looking at the importance of littoral-derived carbon to fish communities. Um, and it's the mean values of littoral-derived carbon to 75 different communities uh, worldwide. And what I like uh, about this plot is it shows you high variability. So we have some lakes that do not rely at all on uh, littoral benthic carbon and others that are highly reliant on it. And my project is looking at some of, oh, and then in terrestrial ecosystems, you or in lakes, there are also some systems that rely heavily on terrestrial carbon and others not at all. Okay, next slide. Um, and one advanced. So there are, what drives this variability? It could be, there are, is some evidence that differing amounts of littoral uh, availability, littoral carbon, derived carbon could be driving it. Uh, next, it, one more. Um, it could be differing amounts of terrestrial carbon inputting being more terrestrial carbon availability. And then one more. There is also evidence that uh, population density can influence how uh, fish populations use carbon. So, for example, um, increased density can drive fish to utilize resources that they otherwise would not be. All right, next slide. 
So we observe variability in reliance on carbon sources and what drives this variability. My question hones in on that and just says, does relative habitat availability and fish population abundance determine rainbow trout reliance on littoral benthic, terrestrial, and pelagic derived carbon in lakes? And specifically for my research, I'm looking at two categories of factors for relative habitat availability, littoral extent and terrestrial extent around the lake. Next slide. To address this question, my approach was to first quantify the proportional reliance on littoral benthic, pelagic, and terrestrial carbon by rainbow trout. And two, identify shifts in reliance associated with physical and biological factors and their interactions. Uh, next slide. And mountain lakes provide an ideal study system to address these questions. So we selected 16 lakes in Washington that shared climate, geology, ge geological fe features, and were in under undeveloped catchments. They all had intact shorelines. And we also selected lakes that were naturally fishless, but had been stocked with rainbow trout, which gives a little bit of uh, lever on density. And the food webs were similar and relatively simple. And these lakes are all primarily in the south southwestern corner of the Alpine Lakes Wilderness in Washington State. And we included uh, three lakes outside of that wilderness. The lakes were all reasonably close to each other, no more than four kilometers to get to a lake from one of our backcountry base camps. And you can also see on this map that some of the lakes near our lakes we did not sample. And that was because they were stocked with uh, a species other than or in addition to rainbow trout. Uh, next slide. So first we established that we had gradients among the lakes related to the relative amount of littoral habitat, differences in terrestrial inputs, which we calculated as a total area into total volume, and also a, a range of population abundances, which we measured as CPUE, catch per unit effort. Um, we also, uh, we made bathymetric maps at each lake, um, and we also measured light attenuation, and the light attenuation measurement was to estimate each lake's littoral extent which we calculated as the portion of lake bottom receiving 1% or more of surface light. We estimated terrestrial loading. Okay, I said that. I haven't practiced this for like a week. Okay. At each lake, along with the fish we captured, we also collected samples of primary producers from each source pool. So pelagic cestin from the open water habitat, littoral paraphyton from rocks in the littoral zone, and terrestrial vegetation. We completed stable isotope analysis on all samples from all lakes. Oh, next, you can advance one. There we go. So stable isotopes on all lakes. Uh, next slide. Um, so my first objective was to quantify proportional reliance on littoral benthic, pelagic, and terrestrial carbon by rainbow trout. And that was completed with stable isotope mixing models. Next slide. Oops. For those of you new to stable isotopes or mixing models, I wanna quickly explain in differing habitats, there is natural variability in carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes that occurs during primary production. We can use knowledge of this natural variability to quantify portions of those sources that end up contributing to a whole. And this is a mixing model. I like to think of it as mixing paint. Isotope values for carbon are like the range of colors from blue to red. And each carbon source has a value that corresponds with the color. Pelagic may be blue, littoral red, and terrestrial purple. And if we have a fish with quote unquote purple body carbon, we don't know if that carbon is a mixture of blue and red, i.e. 50-50 pelagic and littoral, or if it was all purple, um, all originating in the terrestrial environment. But with a second stable isotope, you can hit one or forward like nitrogen, which in this metaphor ranges from black to white, if I assess the grayness alongside the purpleness, then there is only one combination of portion values that will give both the purple tone and the gray shade in question. 
And that is essentially what a what occurs in a sti in stable isotope mixing models, except instead of using colors, we are using numbers. And there are also uh, ways to incorporate uncertainty. Um, next slide. So I, qu I first quantified the proportional reliance on terrestrial, pelagic, and littoral sources for each fish according to the source values of the lake that that fish was captured in, which means that for each fish, I had a composition of proportional reliance, three components that summed to a whole. The uh, portion of fish muscle tissue that contained carbon that was originally fixed in a terrestrial habitat, a littoral habitat, and a pelagic habitat. Uh, advanced one. The second step was to use the composition for each fish and complete a series of linear regressions to evaluate what predictor variables, so littoral extent, terrestrial loading, and population abundance best, best explains the changes to that entire composition. Uh, next slide. So uh, the results from the proportional reliance. So first proportional reliance among pelagic, littoral, and terrestrially derived carbon was variable among and at times within the lakes. Overall, many fish had high portions or relatively high portions of pelagic derived resources. And a good portion of fish relied primarily on some combination of pelagic and littoral derived resources. And a few had some terrestrial lines in there as well. And so the question was, are there factors that sort of drive the variability that we observe? Next slide. Okay. And so my second step was to uh, look at a bunch of, was to take our full model and test iterations dropping predictor variables and the, their interactions and rank the models uh, for best fit. And so here I presented the top five models and you could advance one slide. And um, what is recorded here is the PLIS trace statistic, which demonstrates that most of the variability explained in the models for all five of them was the interaction term between population abundance and littoral extent. And um, next slide. Okay. It is challenging to interpret the coefficients for compositional regressions, especially with an interaction term. So here I'm using the best fit model to generate predictions of consumer resource use across a range of littoral extent and population abundance values. So when littoral extent is high, the orange points, resource use is predicted to be relatively similar among the fish, regardless of population abundance, the line thickness. It is balanced between littoral and pelagic dependence with low terrestrial lines. But when littoral extent is low, those green points, as population abundance increases, reliance on terrestrial resources is predicted to increase. And the panel I'm showing is a low terrestrial loading scenario. And um, you heard me right that it's a low terrestrial loading scenario and our model predicts increased population abundance led to increased reliance on terrestrial resources. And I will circle back to that. Um, next slide or one. Yeah. Um, okay. So looking at the predictors for when terrestrial loading is higher, the predicted reliance in these three resources, when habitat is 100%, littoral is similar regardless of population abundance. But as population abundance increases, reliance on pelagic resources is uh, in predicted to increase. So one explanation for increased reliance on pelagic resources in the high terrestrial loading scenario, it is that it is possible that along with terrestrial inputs are nutrients that promote primary pelagic primary production. And in the low loading lakes, pri pelagic primary production potentially is nutrient limited. And so as uh, fish with increased population abundance need to look for other uh, prey options, they are using terrestrial prey, spiders, um, or whatever insects they can forage for. So my study did not get at mechanisms, so that is my speculation as to the mechanism uh, behind these results. Okay, next slide. So never 
Uh, so my study or our study demonstrates that interactions between littoral habitat availability and population abundance influence how rainbow trout utilize basal resource pathways. And we found that resource use was relatively consistent among littoral, pelagic, and terrestrial resources regardless of littoral habitat availability at low population abundance. However, as abundance increased, that led to presume, leading to presumed interspecific competition. It, in lakes with low littoral extent, habitat structure became more influential, shifting resource use towards terrestrial and pelagic resources. Um, so these results overall suggest the heightened importance of biotic factors, um, such as sort of fish community composition or abundance as a determinant of resource use when littoral habitat is more limited. Um, oh, next slide. Uh, so increased understanding of how populations, species, or communities respond to and interact with changes in the physical environment will aid in understanding how future environmental change leading to gains or losses in specific resource pools, potentially to total extent, might impact an ecosystem. Um, and especially in lakes that are going to have uh, that littoral extent changed by uh, lake level fluctuation. Um, and then another thought was potentially that lake stocking levels can sometimes be determined by lake surface area. Um, and it could be beneficial to consider littoral availability and or uh, the overall habitat around it. Um, next slide. So this project had a lot of support along the way, and I especially want to express gratitude to WALPA. I was the recipient of the David Lamb Memorial Scholarship in 2018, which was incredibly helpful as I kicked off uh, my season of field work, um, and many wonderful supporters and volunteers along the way, and to you guys right now who are making this winging it work. So thank you very much. Oh. Yay, Becca, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for being adaptable. That was wonderful. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, use of colors to explain that isotope model. That was pretty cool. Um, and thanks to everyone for being so flexible with this. Going pretty good, I think. Um, up next, we have Elizabeth Hoots, and Elizabeth is going to talk to us about the life of a caddis fly in Coeur d'Alene Lake. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Beth Hoots, and I'm a senior at the University of Idaho studying ecology and conservation biology. This research was conducted as part of my senior thesis here, and it is titled Life History of a Benthic Caddisfly in Coeur d'Alene Lake. My co-authors on this project are Frank Wilhelm, my thesis advisor and professor at the University of Idaho, and Ben Schofield with the Coeur d'Alene Tribe Lake Management Department. My talk will take us through an introduction to my study organisms and study system, through my objectives and how we conducted this research. I'll share my results and how I analyzed my data, and then share some early conclusions. But let's start with the basics. Climate change is a global phenomenon, and as such, it affects water bodies around the world. This figure from O'Reilly et al. shows the change in surface water temperature for several large lakes across the globe between the years 1985 and 2009. A red dot on this graph, or on this figure, represents a leak whose temperature increased during that time interval, whereas a blue dot indicates a lake that cooled during that time interval. And we can see that there are both red and blue dots on this figure, but the red dots greatly outnumber the cooling lakes. Especially, we can see that we had a lot of lakes warming in the Pacific Northwest and no lakes that were surveyed cooled. O'Reilly concluded that on average, lakes across the world are warming at a rate of 0.34 degrees Celsius per decade. In the Pacific Northwest, we are of course not immune to this climate change and we see climate change and this warming trend manifested so clearly in our droughts that we've been receiving. Marshall et al. 
studied the percent change in frequency of two year drought periods across the West and found that they were increasing almost everywhere. In the Idaho Panhandle region where my study was conducted, this frequency of two year drought periods has increased by up to 80%. And this can be attributed to a lack of snowfall, largely, as well as an earlier and faster melt in the spring. Now, while humans as endotherms have a little bit of flexibility to um, adjust to these new temperature changes, other organisms are ectothermic or poikilothermic, and their development rate is directly tied to the temperature, even if it's warming at a very quick rate. We can measure that rate um, between their development rate and the temperature of their surroundings, that relationship, with the Van't Hoff coefficient or a Q10 relationship, which measures the change to an organism's development rate as the temperature of its surroundings changes by 10 degrees Celsius. So for example, a common Q10 relationship is a Q10 of 2, graphed here. In a Q10 of 2 relationship, we would expect to see development rate double as temperature increases by 10 degrees Celsius. One such poikilotherm is my study organism, Nectocyte albida. They are benthic case-building caddisflies found in Coeur d'Alene Lake, and they are pictured below in their adult form here. Nectocyte albida is of interest largely because they are a native predator of the invasive Eurasian water milfoil, which is pictured here, topping out the lake fully grown and overgrown in 2015. Now, 2015 was a notable year for many reasons, but the macrophyte growth is really worth mentioning. As it stands, Nectopsyche albida is not an effective biocontrol for Eurasian water milfoil, even though they do predate on the macrophyte. Essentially, by the time Nectopsyche albida reaches a stage in its life, under current conditions where they're able to consume a critical biomass of Eurasian water milfoil, the macrophyte's already established in the ecosystem, it's grown, it's past its overwintering and dying plants and really dominating the ecosystem again. However, if warming waters push Nectopsyche albida to begin maturing earlier in the year and Eurasian water milfoil's growth is limited by number of daylight hours, it's possible that that shift could change their predator-prey relationship and make Nectocyte albida a more effective biocontrol organism. But let's talk about how Nectocyte albida does grow. They start as eggs, which hatch into larvae, and those larvae grow through five instar phases. Pictured here is a fifth instar, featuring that characteristic Nectopsyche albida V on its head capsule. Once they grow through their fifth instar and complete their growth, they pupate for about three weeks by retreating into their case, sealing themselves off, and fixing to a macrophyte. A pupae emerge into winged adults, which live for about one to two days, during which time they mate, deposit eggs, and die. I studied Nectopsyche albida to answer the following questions. First, how will the temperature of Coeur d'Alene Lake change under current climate change trends? And second, how is the pupation time of Nectopsyche albida affected by those rising temperatures? These relate to my specific prediction, which is that Nectopsyche albida responds to temperature changes in accordance with a Q10 of 2 relationship, similar to other insects. Many of you are likely familiar with my study site. It is Coeur d'Alene Lake, located in the northern panhandle region of the state of Idaho. I was specifically working in the Chat Colette region in the south part of Coeur d'Alene Lake, pictured here. Now in Chat Colette Lake, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe Lake Management Department has been monitoring the temperature and collecting temperature data in 15 minute intervals since 2015. They accomplished this using hobo data loggers, which they've deployed along the St. Joe River levee at about one meter depth. They fix these loggers to pilings with steel cable and leave them out there to autonomously collect data. Now, what I've done is take those 15 minute data points 
and condense them into monthly averages for every year they've been collecting data so far. Um, and this gives us a little bit of perspective to zoom out and see the interannual variability of these temperatures in the water. And what we see is more or less every year follows a pretty similar pattern of warmth through the seasons, with the notable exception of 2015, shown here in green. 2015 was a very warm year, so warm, in fact, that the tribe now considers it um, representative of what we may expect to see under climate change conditions toward the end of this century. Using these temperature data will help me answer my first question about how climate change trends will affect the temperature of Coeur d'Alene Lake. In the field, I collected caddisflies by wading in and by pulling up macrophytes into the boat and picking off the caddisflies that were feeding on them. I was looking for fourth and fifth instars about to pupate, and I would sort through the caddisflies that we pulled up uh, once they were in the boat to make sure that they were Nectocyche albida and not a similar caddisfly species found in the lake, and to make sure they were instars. Then I would take the caddisflies back to the lab for the observational experiment we were conducting there. I kept caddisflies at 22 and 35 degrees Celsius during their pupation process and monitored them daily to see if they'd begun or ended pupation. You can see here an about to pupate caddisfly on the left photo in the red circle and two caddisflies that have already pupated in the right photo. Once they did pupate and emerged as adults, of course, we had to keep them under a mesh tent to make sure that they didn't escape into the lab. They were all kept in lake water with a sandy substrate to mimic the chapcolette benthos and some macrophytes to consume if they were hungry. And this study helped me establish a Q10 relationship for Nectocyche albida, answering my question about how their pupation time was affected by rising temperatures into my results, I used temperature and climate predictions from the Abatsoglu and Brown climate toolbox. They have these projections for air temperature through the end of the century, but what I wanted was water temperature. So what I did was I regressed the temp water temperature data that the tribe has collected for the Chatcolette region with some temperature data collected at the Coeur d'Alene weather station to come up with a relationship between air and water temperature for the area which I then applied to these temperature projections to get some water temperature projections for Chatcolette Lake through the end of the century. And to clarify here, when I say summer high warming or winter low warming, I mean the average summer or winter temperature under a high or low warming scenario. And what you'll notice right off the bat here is that these average temperatures are not 10 degrees higher than they were in 2015 out in 2099. However, they are not insignificant in their warming. In the summer, we're looking at a temperature increase of about 5.4 degrees Celsius under high warming scenarios. And in the winter, we're looking at about 4.5 degrees Celsius. How will that affect caddisflies? Let's look at their Q10 relationship first. My data showed an approximately Q10 of two relationship. However, due to this global pandemic we're living in, I was not able to complete my temperature data and collect more than two data points, including a colder and more realistic to chat Colette Lake's water temperature trial at 12 degrees Celsius. However, I was able to complete trials at about 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, which has given us the following curve. Now, I don't expect you to take the word of these two data points um, for Nectocyche albida having a Q10 of 2 relationship. So what I've done is conducted a literature review for the Q10 relationship of several um, poikilotherms living in aquatic environments across the literature. We've got fish, echinoderms, crustaceans, zooplankton, insects, etc. And what we see here is although their Q10 values range from 1 to 3.6, the average across taxa is about 2. And that allows me to confidently say that although I only have two data points reflecting a Q10 of 2 relationship for Nectocyche albida, 
they likely do not stray far from this trend. Therefore, using those data points, I conducted a log log regression to get a linear equation for the relationship between pupation length and water temperature. This relationship had a slope of 1.9, which is, again, very close to a Q10 of 2. This relationship could be applied to our temperature warm, warming data uh, to approximate the amount of days we would expect to see pupation time decrease under the warming predicted for the years between 2015 and 2099. And what we found was that we expect to see nectocycle beta pupation occur between 9.2 and 12.3 days faster in 2099 compared to 2015. To summarize, Chat and Colette Lake will warm between 2.2 and 5.6 degrees Celsius by 2099 in comparison with 2015 temperatures. My findings show that Nectosyche albida grows with approximately a Q10 of 2 relationship with temperature. Therefore, caddis fly pupation in the wild in Chat Colette Lake will be up to 12.3 days shorter in 2099 than in 2015 which has some pretty significant implications for these organisms. Notably, their relationship with macrophytes. This has the potential to upend their predator-prey relationship. And it could shift their hatch date, possibly making room for an additional generation per annual cycle over time. They overwinter as fourth or fifth instars, but with a couple of extra weeks, it's possible that they could be fully matured by then. To conclude, I'd like to bring us back to our 2015 temperature data. I've replicated that graph here and superimposed um, the climate toolbox predictions for summer and winter warming in the year 2099. And what we see here is that 2015, while an outlier now, will likely become the norm under a high warming scenario in the future. And while Maybe this environment, this ecosystem can weather one 2015 when it becomes the norm, when that becomes the average summer temperature, we expect to see significant impacts on the temperature dependent organisms in this ecosystem. I'd also like to talk briefly about these light limited macrophytes and their growth related to caddisflies. While macrophytes grow in accordance with the number of daylight hours we see, Nectosyche albida and other caddisflies grow faster when it's warmer, as we've seen. So while they may be hitting their peak growth after the macrophytes have hit their peak growth and really established themselves in the ecosystem, we could be looking at a shift to earlier where their peak growth occurs while the macrophytes are still establishing themselves in the ecosystem, potentially setting up Nectosyche albida to be an effective biocontrol for Eurasian water milfoil in the future. To look at some future directions that I'd like to take this study in, I would like to look at specifically when macrophytes are growing in this ecosystem and look at a species breakdown of what occurs first and when. I'd also like to compare those species specific data with light data uh, collected by the tribe using Secchi disks um, for the past few years. I also plan to analyze some historic Coeur weather data, which the weather station has back to the 1930s, to look at how the climate has changed in the past century, while also looking forward to how it may change in the coming century. I'd like to give thanks to the Coeur tribe for their permission to study and collect samples on their land and for sharing their equipment and their knowledge with me during this project. I'd also like to thank Walba and the U of I Summer, Research, Summer Undergraduate Research Fund for their generous financial support of this project. I would also like to thank and recognize Stephanie Estelle for her guidance and early support of this project. Without her mentorship, I would have had a much harder time getting started. Thank you so much for watching my talk today. I hope to see you at the question and answer session later. Um, and feel free to contact me via email at ehoots at uidaho.edu. Thanks so much, Beth. Uh, that was great. It was really interesting. Um, I really appreciated hearing about how you had to deal with 
uh, not being able to collect as much data as you had hoped because of a global pandemic. Um, that's something I think many of us are dealing with, both in and out of academia. So uh, I look forward to hearing how your work progresses. Uh, next up, we have Drew Stang. Drew is going to be talking to us today about some fish habitat in Clear Lake, California. Thanks, Drew. Hey there, my name is Drew Stang. I'm here to present my thesis research on impacts of hydrodynamic processes on pelagic fish habitat in Clear Lake, California. I just recently graduated UC Davis with my master's in civil and environmental engineering, and I'm now an engineer at Herrera Environmental Consultants in Seattle. So my thesis research took place in Clear Lake, California. Um, it's a large, shallow, polymictic, hypereutrophic lake located in Northern California. It regularly experiences large algal blooms, um, and because of this, it has received a lot of attention, and now UC Davis is leading a scientific study to figure out what the cause is of these algal blooms and what's forcing them. And so there's plenty of research being conducted by a number of my lab mates right now, um, but my studies really focused, one, on quantifying the hydrodynamic processes uh, actually occurring in Clear Lake, and specifically the lower arm, and then also looking at how eutrophication and hypoxia and increased stratification are changing fish habitat in Clear Lake. And so specifically looking at the map on, on the right here, um, you can see Clear Lake and see that it's multi-basin. Um, and my study took place specifically in the lower arm there um, within the red box. And so it's only a sub portion of the lake, but it's also the deepest portion and representative of the rest. So really because of time, I'm only gonna focus on the fish side of this study, um, but just note that the hydrodynamics were also focused, but just really don't have time to cover it. So just gonna focus on the fish results and go from there. So the objectives behind this study really in regard to the fish were to look at how hypoxia was going to alter uh, their distribution throughout the water column. And so really, um, I guess the idea would be that hypolimnetic hypoxia is forcing these fish out of their preferred habitat. And then also that because of stratification that these fish are going to be forced out of maybe their preferred epilimnetic habitat. And when you combine both of these together, um, their habitat is going to be reduced and maybe they'll be squeezed into a confined area within the lake. Um, and there's been a few studies in the past that have referred this, to this as the thermal dissolved oxygen squeeze. It's really limiting their habitat, increasing species overlap, um, and can have a number of, of other effects um, for, the, for the populations as a whole. And so these are a few of the fish, um, just in this figure to the right, um, that are common pelagic fish in Clear Lake. And so we have largemouth bass, common carp, threadfin shad, crappie, and a number of catfish species. So for the field study, we deployed a number of instruments and really it sort of narrows down to an echo sounder and a uh, instrument chain with thermistors and dissolved oxygen sensors. And so on the right first, looking at this instrument chain, it was subsurface to avoid any boating incidents. Um, it had thermistors, dissolved oxygen sensors, and uh, they were basically distributed throughout the water column and provided a full profile of temperature and, and DO um, through the study period. And then 100 meters away from this, we had an echo sounder that was deployed on the bottom, up, looking up with uh, pretty high vertical resolution and temporal resolution of one second sampling intervals and one centimeter vertical cells. This is just to capture any size of fish, um, any fish that would pass over the beam. And so as these fish are passing over the beam of this echo sounder and identified as fish, we associated temperature and dissolved oxygen to each one of these fish. And so at the end of the day, we had a pretty robust data set um, for these fish with associated temperature, DO, depth, time of day. And, um, you know, it was, it was a lot of data and lots of process, but at the end of the day, um, using, you know, sort of these newer instruments really produced uh, a unique data set that you wouldn't otherwise get using standard methods such as gill nets or um, CTD profiles, you know, maybe three days of the month. And so 
we deployed all these instruments throughout August 2019 um, in hopes to see, I guess, some hypoxia develop during this time and sort of to prove this hypothesis of the thermal dissolved oxygen squeeze. And so looking first at the physical conditions before we dive into to more of the fish related data, um, we can see here there's, there's two contour plots, uh, temperatures on top and DO is on the bottom. And so this is over, you know, August 2019 and the instruments in their sort of spacing throughout the water column um, are on the Y axis and indicated by these white dots. Um, and the hypoxic periods are uh, identified by the black bars on the X axis. And so you can see there were three hypoxic events, um, you know, associated with these stratification events as well. And another thing to note, specifically looking at the temperature profile that the water column is oscillating and changing on this sort of diurnal um, period, or period. And, you know, this is largely because of diurnal winds. And this is really what we found in the hydrodynamic study. This is really what's forcing the system. And so you can also see this in the DO data as well. It's a little clearer in the temperature, but dissolved oxygen is also fluctuating quite significantly. And this is because of a lot of the horizontal transport. This is due to thermocline tilting. So it's a little bit of everything, but it is a really highly dynamic system. Um, but we did see some hypoxia develop, um, not maybe not as much as we would have preferred, you know, just for this study, improving this concept, but it was a great year for the lake, not too many algal blooms. Um, and overall, uh, I think it gave us, you know, enough data in these conditions um, to actually prove this concept. And so these are what the raw sort of echo sounder results look like. And this is, in, I guess, what I will refer to it as, as an echogram. On the x-axis, we have day of year. On the y, we have depth. And the color scales volume volumetric backscatter strength and so this is basically just you know all these darker blobs in the water column are identified as fish and basically these echograms all this data was input to an algorithm that i made that used uh, thresholding techniques to identify fish and sort of exclude noise um, you know you can see a lot of other particles in the water and this these are likely algae suspended sediments um, you know, there actually are a lot of micro bubbles in the upper water column um, that got excluded from this image, but largely you can just see that these fish are identified um, throughout this period. It's a rather active period, um, but this sort of gets the point across of how we actually identified these fish. So looking at the data, sort of, sort of data set as a whole, really, um, we have a few bar plots here. And on the y-axis, we have total fish count. And on the x, we have a few of these parameters, depth, temperature, time of day, and dissolved oxygen. And so first looking at depth, you can see this bimodal distribution. And this really brings out a great point from this data set in that it's, you know, we're identifying air bladders of fish. And we don't necessarily know which species of fish is associated with each one of these um, signals. And so this bimodal distribution really sort of points out that, you know, over the whole month of August, it's, it's really likely that there is several different species going on and two clearly prefer two different depths. And that's one hypothesis of this, but it, it does bring out a, a great point. And then looking at C, the time of day plot, we can see that most of the fish pinged and identified are around sunset and sunrise. Um, and then looking down at temperature, uh, we can see that, you know, it really doesn't tell us too much very clearly. And we'll get back to temperature in a few slides. But focusing now on dissolved oxygen, uh, you can see really that, that there's no fish identified below four milligrams per liter um, of DO. And so sort of the first question that I asked myself when I saw this was, you know, well, how much how much available habitat was below this four milligrams per liter? And so these next two plots sort of show this a little bit more clear. And on these, the bars, the lightly shaded bars are available habitat and sort of showing that distribution throughout um, each period. And then the dots and the lines are the fish distribution. And so looking first at the top plot, um, this is the hypoxic periods. And so this, this is basically, look, you know, reflecting back on that plot of 
temperature and DO, these were just the periods where hypoxia was present in the water column. And then the blue plot is periods where the water column was normoxic or there was the absence of hypoxia. And so for the normoxic um, the blue plot on the bottom, you can see that the fish distribution really matches the available habitat, meaning that fish were pretty well distributed throughout the water column uh, during this time. And then as we jump up to the hypoxic period, um, we can see that the distribution of fish and the distribution of available habitat don't really cross over very well, and they're not similar. And there was DO uh, concentrations below four, mil four milligrams per liter, but more so, you know, looking at the fact that fish were found at higher DO concentrations. Um, and one hypothesis of this could be that, you know, these higher DO concentrations are a result of, you know, more primary production. Therefore, there's most, more zooplankton there, you know, planktivorous fish um, and then piscivorous fish as well. So maybe just, you know, a lot more fish aggregated near this area. And then looking at the data set at, you know, maybe a finer temporal resolution here, um, we can see that the fish react to changes in the water column. And so at first on the left side of this plot, we can see that, you know, at this period, um, it was stratified, there was hypolimnetic hypoxia, and then there was a mixing event due to strong winds. The water column was mixed and the fish, you know, pretty quickly um, distributed back down um, into the hypolimnia and sort of filling in this area of the lake. And so that was also interesting to see sort of the response and how quickly that actually happened. And so another sort of key finding that we, we found was that there was a correlation between where the fish were and where the metalimnion or thermocline was located. And so as stratification increased, fish were more likely to be near the metalimnion. And then you can sort of see it in this image showing this bottom boundary of fish indicated by the white dots um, fluctuates up and down as temperature also fluctuates. And so this um, color map in the back is of temperature and you can sort of see this sort of color gradient or temperature gradient. And as that oscillates up and down, so does this bottom boundary of fish. And the red line is um, hypoxia, four milligrams per liter. And then the white and black line is the mean biomass depth. And so really this sort of points out that, you know, these fish are aggregating towards the metalimnion for one reason or another. And this sort of supports this hypothesis that fish are aggregating closer to where there is food available. And so oftentimes in lakes, you're going to get, um, you know, higher populations of zooplankton um, near the, the thermocline. And thus, um, you may also have more planktivorous fish there as well. So it was a really sort of interesting study and really the, the key takeaways here, one is that four milligram per liter hypox hypoxia avoidance threshold. Um, similar studies have come out with three milligrams per liter. Um, for Clear Lake, four milligrams per liter seemed to be the ticket. Um, but then overall, these physical conditions really do seem to control fish either directly or indirectly, whether that be from hypoxia or thermal tolerances or um, food availability as well. And so as climate change sort of continues to affect, the, affect these lakes um, through time, you know, these conditions of hypoxia um, and, and stronger stratification, of, stratification events um, are likely going to be more frequent and this thermal dissolved oxygen squeeze is likely also to become more frequent. And there's a number of ecological impacts um, that this may sort of induce, um, but you know, climate change certainly um, amongst many other things is, is not going to help this. And so another sort of key point of this study is that it sort of you know, shows how these newer technologies that are becoming more and more available to us in these instrumentation that we can deploy sort of provide insight to, to what's actually occurring in the lake um, that we wouldn't see otherwise. And so, um, you know, if we went out there once again with a gill net and a CTD, we wouldn't be able to capture the whole month of August as, as easily as we did here and likely wouldn't be able to make some of these conclusions that we, we were able to in this study. So. Um, overall, it's been, you know, a great study and I've really enjoyed working out on Clear Lake, um, hoping to publish it. So, you know, we'll see about that and see where that goes. But I really hope you enjoyed um, 
hearing about my research and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Drew. And thanks to all of our presenters today. You guys did a great job uh, dealing with our last minute changes. Uh, so we're going to hop into some Q&A. Uh, if you guys have any more questions that you'd like to send our presenters, please send them along to info at walpa.org. Uh, our first question is going to be for Angela. Was there much diversity in macrophytes? And if so, was there much of a difference between the ponds? We did not look at macrophytes um, in part because of just time limitations of being out there when um, trying to get to as many ponds as possible in the shortest period of time. So we were kind of focused on getting, you know, some baseline conditions for nutrients, um, uh, macroinvertebrates and zooplankton, but there's certainly a lot more work that could and should be done. There certainly is a lot of um, uh, riparian vegetation in a lot of them. Uh, alder is a is a big player there, and we know that um, as an end fixer, that's certainly has an influence um, on the ponds themselves. So yeah, that's something we really like to look at uh, in the future. Okay, our next question is for Rebecca. Uh, first comment, great job adapting to the technical difficulties. And now our question, were the isotopic measurements of the fish done on muscle tissue or organ tissue? And would organ tissues give you a better idea of short-term or seasonal reliance? My uh, isotopes were done on muscle tissue. And I do not remember whether muscle or, some, or liver is uh, short term or a, better at short term versus better at long term, but I will review that. Fantastic. Okay, and a question for Beth: Is an albida a generalist herbivore, or does it specialize on Eurasian milfoil? That's a great question. It is a generalist, as far as we can tell. Um, Stephanie Estelle, who I think in my acknowledgments, her master's thesis actually goes more into depth on that. Fantastic. Okay. And we have one more question for Angela. And that is what factors contribute to differences in chemistry, residence time, et cetera, between the ponds? Yeah, I wish we knew. Um, we know we kind of know part of the part of the answer to that. So how much groundwater is playing a role? is going to influence conductivity, especially if um, some of these are drying out. So as they're drying, it's going to get more and more kind of concentrated. So um, the groundwater reliance, and I think that's partially, largely a function of just how deep they are. So how you know, deep do they go down to the hip of the groundwater? Or are they more kind of shallow and superficial and are being mostly influenced by snow melt and, and, and precipitation? And so our idea is that pairing the hydrology with, um, not the hydrology, but the uh, isotopes. Um, they kind of represent the hydrology and pairing that with real-time measurements will help us get a better idea about what are driving some of those differences. Um, so that's kind of a work in progress. Great. Okay. That is all we have for questions for this afternoon. I wanna thank all of our presenters once again, uh, not just for this session, but all of our presenters all day and all of our attendees as well as our sponsors and a congratulations to our scholarship winners. Um, I know this was a long day for everyone in our first online conference, but I think it went really well aside from our little blitz here and there. Um, I wanna remind everyone that our Day tomorrow starts at 8 a.m. We have a really great panel set up for public access in Washington Lakes. Um, and I think that's all we have for now. Thanks again to everyone, and we'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 8.